Lord, we just want to uh, lift your name on high, and we thank you for the incredible opportunity that we have to uh, give back to you in praise and worship. You alone are worthy. Uh, you alone deserve all of our praise. And Lord, as we learned at the first service, you're in control of this whole COVID thing and all of the stuff that's going on. And uh, so I just pray that as Christians, we can be bold and certainly not stand in fear, but stand in faith that you're going to uh, accomplish whatever you want to accomplish. So we thank you. We're here to worship you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you ready to worship? All right. Clap offering. Hallelujah. Yay, yay. How are we all doing this morning? Good to see everybody out there watching on YouTube. And uh, we had a wonderful first service here and uh, at Calvary Chapel Maricopa. I want to invite you guys. I, I want to first uh, just 
ask you guys out there to be praying uh, this one prayer request. I really pray that we can get back soon to, to reaching out to our, our younger families and our kids. I, I got to tell you, uh, the one thing that's missing here are our junior high and high school meeting back over here and these three classrooms down here full of little kids. It's breaking my heart every Sunday not to see those kids here learning about Jesus, singing in the back. And so would you join with us in prayer? God, would you please get us back to a place where we can begin to open up our children's ministry? I just love seeing kids running around, breaking stuff, and running into things. I love it. I love it. I mean, it, it just, uh, it's what the church is supposed to be. And so, with that said, I want to greet everybody and welcome you this morning to Calvary Chapel, Maricopa. Um, for those of you that are here, and those of you that are there, wherever there might be, usually in the seat pocket in front, we have a prayer request card that looks like this, and, and, uh, and it's also a visitor card. But you write your information down here if you're a visitor and um, give us that information, and then we usually send a card that looks like this, that has information, more information about the church, and a gift inside of it. So I'm going to tell you what, for those that are here, you can still do that. You, and If you have a prayer request, you can do this. If you want to put your information down, put that in the tithe box here in our foyer. We don't pass a plate here at Calvary Chapel Maricopa, but your giving is is super important. And, uh, and so I want to say this, it's between you and the Lord. Giving it has always been an act of worship, and it will always be an act of worship here between you and Jesus. And so, listen, so this is the deal. If you're watching online, if you've been watching and we don't have your information, let us know that you're watching, and you can do so by emailing us at calvarymaricopa at gmail.com. And, uh, and you can give us your, some of your information, your contact information. If you would do that, we would love to send you a, a, a card welcoming you to, uh, to watching online, welcoming you to the family of God here at CCM, and, uh, and also that you would receive this gift. So email us and let us know. And if you have a prayer request or a praise report and you're watching online, would you, would you email us again at Calvary? maricopa at gmail.com. Let us know what the prayer request or praise report is so that we can be praying with you. Um, for those that are here, we also have invite cards with directions regarding the church and where the church is at and located and service times. And I want to invite you out there. Just, you know, is reach out as much as you can reach out. It's what we're called to do. For those that are here, we have the, the daily breads. If you need a devotion, you can swing by here during the week. They're outside, even though the church might be locked. There's daily bread devotion sitting out on the counter in front of the church doors for all that might take it. Now, uh, there's just a few major things that I want to cover this morning. First is our annual men's retreat. Uh, the men's retreat, the theme this year is, is Fortify. And I had a wonderful time, first of the year, before COVID hit, meeting with a handful of pastors. We went up to Payson to pray about this men's retreat, to really to, to just wait at the Lord's feet for a, a, a theme and, and a direction and some clarity. And we believe we got it. The theme is fortify right out of Psalm 61 too. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense and I shall not be moved. We need to fortify ourselves as men and women of God. Fortify ourselves in our relationship with Christ and the promises of God. And so I want to encourage you guys to go ahead and sign up for the Calvary Chapel Men's Retreat. It's August 14th through the 16th. Now that's Sunday. It officially ends at 10 a.m. on Sunday, Friday night. Uh, 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 evening, it starts with dinner and so on and so forth. You can find out more information about that. I'll tell you where. But but God needs to, uh, the whole word fortify has everything to do with strengthening and encouraging and endurance. And, uh, and I believe God wants to do that work in all of our lives. So the cost of the retreat is $135. You can go to, and you're going to have to come here and get the flyer. I've got a flyer out here. But it's, it's an email. You can go to calvaryfountainhills.org, and you can go to their website to register. That's Calvary. Uh, um, calvaryfountainhills.org and register for the retreat at their website. Um, the rest of the information is here on these flyers. You can email us if you'd like more information about this and, uh, and how you can get plugged in. Now the next thing is uh, we, we have been really, I've been praying personally uh, about how to reach our community and, um, 
and, and we've just, we just, you know, we had so many outreaches and stuff planned uh, the first of the year before this virus hit, and, and I still, we're called to reach our community, and, and to be locked in and locked down is, well, it's kind of not my nature, but, but I, I want to share the gospel. I, I want to reach our community. Yes, I, I want to be smart and, and safe in the process, but I want to reach our community with the gospel of Christ. And so a door has opened to us to do a food distribution ministry, much like a, 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 you know, a food bank or a food pantry thing, twice a month, two Saturdays a month, from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. right here at our church. And, uh, and if you'd like to know more about that, you can, again, email us at calvarymaricopa at gmail.com and say, hey, I want to be a part of this food distribution. It's not going to cost you any money. We have all the food we, we need. We, we've got tractor trailer loads of food. That, that's not an issue. Getting people, getting a team together that wants to reach our community. And, and look, that's not to say that our food bank here in Maricopa isn't doing a great job. They're doing a phenomenal job. And we support our food bank and all that they do. But I will say this, our food bank doesn't share the gospel. And, and, and for me, my conscience, it doesn't allow me. I, I want to support, I want to feed people, but I have to tell them about Jesus. I'm not doing them any good if I'm not telling about Jesus. Putting shoes on orphans' feet is a noble thing to do, but if you're not telling them about Christ, then we're failing as the church. And so we want to do our part in this. And so again, if you'd like to be a part of this food distribution, two Saturdays a month, then please email us and let us know. Let me know, even those that are here. Would you please email us and let us know as we put together that team and begin to pull the trigger on this ministry. And with that said, that's pretty much it. I'd like to pray this morning and we'll continue in worship. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for our time together. And Lord, we want to pray for our church body that's out, out there. It's 300 members strong. And, and Lord, you love us. We're doing our best to stay connected. Lord, I pray for that connectedness. I pray for those that, that are at home that are unable to get out. Lord, would you just surround them with your love and your grace and your mercy? Would you remind them that perfect love casts out all fear and that you love them and that you have a perfect plan for their life? And Lord, I ask that soon that you would bring us back together according to your grace and your mercy i pray for the church lord specifically the church in america lord it needs to stand up it needs to rise up even in the midst of this virus we still are called to be the church and i pray for that lord would you bless our time together bless our worship Bless the teaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. Amen. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus. my shame rising again i bless your name you are my all in all when i fall down you pick me up when i am dry you fill my cup you are my all in
my strength. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus. sin taking my sin my cross my shame rising again i bless your name you are my all in all when i fall down you pick me up when i am dry you fill my cup you are my all in Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus. Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Hallelujah, Lord, your name. You alone are worthy. You alone have all honor. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name Christ alone cornerstone weak man in the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on My anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the sand. 
when he shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, trust in his righteousness alone. Lord, let's stand before the throne.
just thank you so much. And as pastor comes to share uh, the word with us, as we've opened our hearts to you now, I just ask you to bless him, anoint him, give him just the right words for us to hear, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome. Welcome. We are making our way through here. Uh, we are in 3 John, this single little chapter, this little epistle. We're going to tackle it this morning, we're going to then next week be in the book of Jude, which is a one Sunday deal, and then we're going to be in the book of Revelation. Who's ready for an intro to the book of Revelation in a few weeks? We're excited about that. It's time for some revelation, right? We need some revelation. The, the, the world needs some revelation. Amen. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we're excited, but this morning we are in 3 John, and the title of the message is, We All Need an Example. And if that's true, we all need to be an example for someone around us. This is an amazing little letter here, and, and to me, as I, as I read through it, it's just amazing how it reflects the relationship between that of Paul and Timothy. You see, this John and, and Gaius share the same type of relationship. You know, it, just like Timothy was Paul's son in the faith, so too we will recognize in our passage that, that Gaius is, is like John's son in the faith. He, John, the apostle, was Gaius' mentor, that Gaius is a, is a pastor, pastoring a church, and, and has all the struggles and the, and the problems and the issues that come along with that. And, and this letter is helping Gaius do and fulfill his ministry. John is being an example. He's coming alongside of, and we'll see what an amazing example that Gaius is to his church and all those that are watching him and his example. It starts off by saying this, the elder, the elder. Again, the book doesn't identify John, but John has been, this, this epistle has been attributed to John for, for centuries. All have believed that John, this is the author is John, and, and why he said the elder, you know, the old man. In other words, here's a short one chapter epistle from Pops. And he's writing this to Gaius, the elder, the older man. Probably for the same reason he, he, he uses this opening possibly as in 2 John, and that's possibly because of the persecution that was arise, arising here at the end of the first century from Rome. It's possible. He says to the beloved Gaius, Loved. Gaius was loved by John, and that is a beautiful thing. Now, we don't know specifically <clears throat> which Gaius this is because, you see, there was more than one Gaius mentioned in the New Testament. We have a guy by the name of Gaius here in Acts 19, 29, and Acts 20, verse 4, who was a Macedonian who accompanied Paul on his travels. We have the second one here in Romans 16.23 and in 1 Corinthians 1.14, Gaius, a man of Corinth, who was Paul's host on his second missionary journey. And finally, we have this here in 3 John 1. We have this 
basically unknown Christian who Paul addresses this, when I say unknown, unknown which Gaius this is, uh, uh, is he's writing this epistle to. So I don't know if it's this, we're talking about one guy, we're not sure, or three different guys or, or whatever, simply because the, the name Gaius was a very prominent name there in this culture during this time. There are many people that, you know, it was a very common name. So we don't know. Now, <clears throat> uh, interestingly enough, the, the, the name Gaius means Lord, little L. We'll get to, we'll touch more on that. He says, whom I love in truth, a man who by testimony of others <clears throat> is a man of truth and walks in truth. Gaius is loved in the truth by the apostle, a man who himself loves the truth. I think there is no other way to address Gaius than here. A man who John loved, but a man who walked in truth and exemplified truth. He reflects truth. <clears throat> now, interestingly, this led me to 1 Samuel chapter 12. If you're not familiar, Samuel, the prophet of God, there in this chapter, is, is basically instituting the first king of Israel, and that's Saul. And in the first portion, the, the majority of chapter 12, Saul is basically opening up by saying that I'm a man, a godly man, a prophet, a truthful prophet. I'm a, I'm a man of truth. He's kind of establishing himself as the man of God and a man of truth. But in verse 24 of 1 Samuel 12, this is what he tells the people. Now granted, he's speaking of Saul, this king that was, he was instituting, but he's talking to the people. He says, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. This is important. I don't care about your king. I don't care who's your king. I don't care who your president is. He said to the nation of Israel, if you still choose to do wickedly, you're going to be swept away. Now, it wasn't God's intention for them to have a king over them like the other pagan nations. God desired to be their king. But as long as you have king and a king named Saul, you're still accountable to God. And, 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 if, and, and God will allow you in your wickedness to be taken away. Regardless of who your president is, regardless of who your king is, you still have the responsibility to follow after the Lord. The exhortation to walk in faith and not in fear, to serve the Lord in truth and not in wickedness goes out to all as well as Saul. Question, is truth loved in today's culture? Is it important to be men and women who walk in truth and are loved and acknowledged because of that alone? You see, we get sidetracked by so many other things. And I'm telling you, your wealth and all that you think you're accomplishing in this life means absolutely nothing if you are not men and women, if we are not men and women of truth. Truth, right? It's in truth that we reflect the light of Christ. Those that are in the truth and ground in the truth don't follow the lie. It's as simple as this. I would like to read to you Psalm 15. It's very short, but listen to this. Listen to the Psalm of David. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised. But he honors those who fear the Lord. 
He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his own money as usury, nor does take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Never be moved. The psalmist is writing and he's found what to be true in life is the one who's put their faith and trust and walk in truth, never find themselves in shame. Back to 1 John. John 1.14 says this, And the Word, you're familiar with it, became flesh and dwelt among us. And what's written is, We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. We beheld it, the glory of God. And what did we see? What was our experience? The glory was full of grace and truth. The glory of God. Do you know what the glory of God looks like? Grace and truth. You know, our, our responsibility here in this life is to glorify God. I want my life to glorify the Lord. And if your life is going to glorify the Lord, then you're going to be a man or woman who is founded and living out, walking in grace and truth. John 1.17 For the law of Moses was, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Remember, the scriptures teach that that love and grace, that grace and truth fulfilled the law. It completed the law. The law was completed in grace and truth. Children of God who live out their lives in grace and truth. Verse 2 he says, now, beloved, I pray that you prosper in all things and be healthy just as your soul prospers. Second time that he's used the word beloved. The word here for prosper literally means to have a prosperous journey. In this way, metaphorically, John is saying, I hope you succeed. It's like saying, I hope everything goes well with you on your travels to California. Safe travels. It was a very common phrase of letters of this time. But ironically, some were teaching that John here was, was, was speaking a prophetic word of prosperity, wealth, and health over Gaius' life and ministry. But that's not the case at all. In context, John is simply letting Gaius know that, hey, I'm praying for you, that you're well, and that God's meeting your needs. John wanted the best for Gaius. Of course he did. But here's the kicker. It's one thing to say, hey, I, I hope things are really well with you today. I, I hope that you're, you're, you're healthy and that all your needs are met. And it's another thing to say that and to say that's how I'm praying for you just as your soul prospers. What, what's he saying here? Well, let me make this clear. John is making an analogy between the condition of our health and the condition of our soul. This is, this is the deal. If you're not doing all that great with the Lord, and someone was to pray that over you, you wouldn't feel very good. I'm praying that your way goes good and that your health is good in the same way that I know your soul is perfectly secure, that your soul is perfectly provided for by the blood of Christ, that your soul is well taken care of. Your soul is not in need of anything. You're born again, you're saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. 
Now, the sad part about it is, if you're not walking with the Lord, and your soul's not in a good place, and someone prays that, you're not going to feel too good about their prayer. You're going to say, I wish you would have prayed something else, like a wealth, health, and prosperity blessing, and leave my soul out of it. (laughs) Amen? There's a certain confidence. You see how powerful this blessing was? Because it reflected Gaius' life. It reflected him walking in truth. That's powerful. Many Christians would be desperately ill if their physical health was instantly in the same state as their spiritual health. And you're worried about COVID? And I'm worried about COVID? Listen, everything, everything that you work so hard for, everything that you want everyone else to see, your wealth and the things that you own and how hard you work mean nothing. The only thing that's on trial here and that's reflected, what's mentioned is that Gaius was a man of truth and he walked in truth and everybody saw it. Everybody testified to it. Everybody knew it. And that's powerful. That is powerful. I pray that your life follows the condition of your soul. But before I pray that, I pray that your soul is in a good standing with God in Christ Jesus. Luke 12, 4 through 5. Listen to what Jesus says. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. Can I, can I read that again to you? Luke 12, verse 4. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. Verse 5. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Fear him. He has no greater joy than to hear that his children are walking in truth. Just like the heart of the Apostle Paul. A true minister, John is. And we'll see that Gaius has the same heart as he's sending missionaries and uh, sending others out in in the next few verses. But I want to say this. It is a joyful thing when people are walking in truth because of another's example. But it means more than just living correct doctrine. Walking in truth. Listen, it has the idea and speaks of a person, a man or woman, who is walking in far more than doctrine. It speaks of a person who is consistent, one who has been tested and found true. And it is a sad day when we run across a Christian who is sound in doctrine but their life doesn't reflect it. I've seen many people that are hyper-concerned to the point of arrogance about making sure every T is crossed and every I is dotted when it comes to my theology and my doctrine. But my personal day-to-day life doesn't reflect it at all. And this is the case. If I think that I've got all my doctrine right and I'm not living it out, it's going to be short-lived before my bad lifestyle affects my so-called perfect doctrine. And vice versa. 
You might think, I'm living a clean life and a godly life. But if your doctrine's all wrong, it won't be long before your bad doctrine affects your so-called clean life. Listen, with Gaius, he was an example, just as the Apostle John, my doctrine reflected my life. And I'd rather be the guy who says, hey, I know this much, but I'm living this much, than to be the knothead who says, I know this much, and I'm living this much. Because I'm not an example. I'm not bringing any glory to God. I'm not having an effect on anybody's life. That doctrine has an effect on someone's life. You become an example when you're living it out. It matters. You want revival in the church. We want revival in America. We want the church to live in faith and not in fear. What starts with you and I, each and every day, trusting God and living out our faith. To walk in truth means to walk in a way that is real, that is genuine. It's not phony. not hypocritical you're not living in darkness you're not living out a lie verse 5 picking up down here he says beloved again he, he he's just so close this 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 whole thing again reflects that loving relationship just as paul had with timothy here john and gaius and listen to what he says He says, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers. (laughs) You do it faithfully. Not only is Gaius a tremendous example of truth and walking in truth, but Gaius is a servant, a real servant. He's saying, listen, in everything you do, both for those in the church, those of faith, your brothers and sisters in Christ, and everything that you're doing even for the stranger, You're doing it for the glory of God. You're doing it faithfully as unto him is what John is saying. You know, right, that everything we do for the Lord is going to be weighed in the end. It's going to be weighed. And this is why I believe that there are going to be countless pastors of these small little churches throughout the world who faithfully preach the word and love their flock and preach the word and love their flock and preach, whether how, no matter how small it is, they're going to be at the front of the line. Because in a lot of these big churches, not all, the pastor's got preeminence. He's more like a Diotrephes, Diotrephes than, than he is a Gaius. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. John is praising Gaius for much more than just his hospitality, but his willingness to be faithful to God, to the people of God. And this is not trivial. This is is Gaius practically working out his faith. John had commanded us to love one another. To to love one another. A compliment. Everything that you're doing, you're doing it faithfully. You know one of the beauties about Calvary Chapel, and if you, after 30 years, it's like, it's this upside down pyramid. You know, that the senior pastor serves from the bottom. You know, he's, not, he's, he's, he's like more like Gaius. He's, he, he, he's serving from the bottom. He's not desiring to have preeminence. And, he, and a, big, a, a big portion of, of our, our leadership style and, and what is taught and what is exemplified is that we're servants. And that we're called to be faithful in, in, in everything that we do, faithful unto the Lord. Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and what? Faithfulness. 
It's a fruit of a spirit. A spirit-filled believer is faithful in the things of God. And Jesus, remember what he said when we will see him face to face? Some of us, hopefully, prayerfully, many of us, will hear these words in Matthew 25, 21. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter in to the joy of your Lord. Wow. What is God asking you to be faithful to? He just says, hey, just the things that are in front of you today. Don't try to set out and be faithful to things that God ain't called you to. Just be faithful to what God has put in front of you each and every day. Live, live right now. Live in the moment. Serve the person who's in front of you. Love today in the situation where it's difficult to love. And it will have great effect on tomorrow. Because listen to what he says. You have bore witness of your love before the church. Everybody saw this. It was unanimous. This is a strong testimony. The church is called, and the people of God are called to be good witnesses. But I want to say this. It's not what people say about you in the world that really matters. It's what people of faith say about you. Because truth reflects truth. I, I, you know, if someone who doesn't know Christ, if someone doesn't even know you, if someone comes and makes an accusation against Doug, and I know they don't even know Doug, they, they've maybe spent 10 minutes with Doug, right? I mean, really, how do you know that accusation is even grounded in truth? I know the guy, right? You see, there's a difference. When you hang out with the Lord, you are known for hanging out with the Lord. Amen? And any accusation that's brought against you is quickly dismantled. There's great things that come from walking with truth, walking in truth. But what's powerful here, as we're going through five through eight, right? He, he, everything that he does for the brethren and for strangers, he's doing it faithfully. The church is bearing witness of it. And then, so what are they bearing witness of? What's one of the things that he was doing? It says right here, when if you send them forward, or when you're sending them out, on their journey, you're doing it in a manner, manner worthy of God. So this is the situation within context. Just like today, but even more so in the first century church, you would have missionaries coming through your local town and through your local church, worship leaders and, and, and Bible teachers and, and other people of faith. And Christianity was called to be hospitable, welcoming, as, as we're all examples, we're bringing the other people of faith in and then sending them out. And so what Gaius is doing is Gaius, just like he had been equipped and sent out, he was taking men and women in, missionaries, receiving them well, loving them, and then sending them back out of the missionary field in a worthy way, in a godly way. Wow. That, that, is, that is crazy amazing that he's doing that. Again, the church is bearing witness to this. And John is commending him for his faithful support in how he stood with ministers and missionaries. And when we stand and when we support the work of the ministry and when we support miss missionaries, we are being examples of God's faithfulness. 
Not to mention we're sharing in, their, in the fruit of what God's doing in their ministry. Just as John was, was, was partaking of the same fruit in Gaius' ministry, Gaius was also partaking in the faithfulness of the ministry of those that he was sending out. Because we're the family of God. And then he makes the statement, taking nothing from the Gentiles. This is powerful. He, listen, in the ancient world, they were to receive offerings many times from even the general public. But he's saying in this case, the church of God, because of your example, is stepping up. And you're not having to go out and, 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 and knock on doors for your funding. God's supplying it through the faithful giving of the church, not the world. It was the work of God being provided for by the people of God for the glory of God. Is that awesome? What faithfulness, what faithfulness, what an example, what an example in a manner worthy of God. Do you think for a minute God can't provide it's his church. You're his son and daughter. Be faithful. Walk in truth. Because giving, serving, and ministry in general must be done in a worthy manner and be done by the family of God. Not the world. I want to read Matthew 10, 40 to you and 42. Listen to the words of Jesus. He who receives you, receives me. And he who receives me, receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Faithfulness. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Faithfulness. And whoever gives one of these little ones, or little ones only a cup of water in, my name, in the name of a disciple, uh, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. Well done, good and faithful servant, child of God. And so at the bottom, back to 1 John, or excuse me, 3 John, looking at the bottom of, uh, of verse 8, it says, we therefore ought to receive such, just as I was just reading to you in Matthew 10, that we may become fellow workers, co-labors. For what? For the truth. What's on trial today? Truth, isn't it? What is the gospel? The good news, the truth. Verse 9 through 11. I wrote to the church. There's a previous letter that had been written by John to this church. John's saying, I wrote a letter specifically to the church by Diotrephes who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. He did not receive the letter. We don't know exactly what was in the letter, but we can have a really good idea what was in the letter by what's being said here. It was a letter of correction, no doubt. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, Dodgephy's deeds, which he does, Pratting against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, who want to receive them, who want to be walking in truth and good examples, putting them out of the church. He's kicking them out of the church for being loving and receptive, giving. Guys like Gaius. 
But he who does evil has not seen God. Here is a public rebuke, no doubt. He had already rebuked him in a previous letter. This is another public rebuke. And in the closing, John's saying, I want to come to you. I want to see you face to face, Gaius. And in essence, you know that there's going to be a greater public rebuke coming from John, the elder statesman, to Diotrephes. Remember, though, John is the apostle of love and will call Diotrephes out by name. Sometimes that doesn't seem like a loving thing to do, but the leaders of the church need to do such things sometimes, following the command of Scripture. Romans 6, 17, and, uh, and we got 2 Timothy 4, 14 through 15, when it comes to doing church discipline, and the loving, loving elder statesman, Apostle John, will do so when he gets there. But you see, Diotrephes, his problem was, you see, Preeminence. I got to have preeminence. You know, there, sometimes we see that with leaders and, and people in their homes and households and at work. They're over asserting their authority, always reminding you that he's or she's or they're in control. I have to have preeminence. I have to have control. I have to be first. I have to be top dog and I have to let everybody know. It's an issue of pride. And it goes right back to the very first sin ever committed by Satan in heaven. Satan had to have preeminence. It's a bad thing. The idea here is it just didn't stop. He thought he was defending himself by pratting against and speaking malicious words towards those who were walking in the truth. I don't really care what anybody says about me who's not walking in truth. I care about those things that are said about me by people who are walking in the truth. And I would like to think that John wasn't really affected by these words, nor was Gaius, because in fact, remember throughout the scripture here, the testimony is the fact that everybody in the church knew the truth, and they could see the example in Gaius's life versus Diotrephes' ministry. There was a big contrast here. You know, today, we still have the issue of Christians who who reject things taught by the apostles. Sometimes, I have literally read truth from Scripture, and I've stepped down from the pulpit, and I've been met with rejection. I've literally spoken the word, and it's been rejected the minute I've stepped down from here. It still exists today. They're not concerned with truth. Colossians 1.18 says, And he is the head of the body, the head of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he, Christ, right, may have preeminence. There is one who has preeminence. There is one who's getting the glory for all that is done for those who are walking in truth. And it's God who gets the glory. It's God who has the preeminence. That's all that we're concerned about. And with the pratting and the malicious words, God wasn't getting the glory from Diotrephes' ministry. In fact, it got worse. Instead of loving people and bringing people into the church, we see that he's putting them out of the church. He's running them off. Those who wanted to reach out, those who wanted to be hospitable, those who wanted to support missionaries and other teachers coming through. He says, get out of here if that's the way you're going to be. You know, the whole idea of preeminence, I want to tell you this, this is 
This is, this is the thing. Within even the structure, not just the church, but even in home structure, in the home, sometimes there's a spouse that has to have preeminence. And that's a deadly thing. I ha- I'm a man who I have to be in control. Or I'm a woman who has to be in control. And that doesn't reflect. That's not God's will or God's glory. It's not walking in truth. Your number one goal is to love your spouse, to receive them and to accept them. It it correlates with what we're learning here, even in the church. Diotrephes was a bad example. And John says, don't imitate what is evil. He calls it out. It's not just bad, this is evil. But imitate what is good. Now, ironically, John did not excommunicate Diotrephes, although he had the authority as an apostle to do so. Instead, he's simply exposing it, calling it out, and trusting that the Christians will avoid Diotrephes and that the Holy Spirit would bring about repentance in his life. Verse 12. Now here's the other one. Demetrius. Many believe that it was Demetrius who brought the letter to, from John to Gaius. But listen to Demetrius. Demetrius, he, he has a good testimony from all. Another, here's another example. Another minister, another servant of God that's been affected by the servanthood and the, and the faithfulness of another And he has a strong testimony. Here John commends Gaius, but he also is is commending Demetrius to Gaius. That he was worthy of that Christian hospitality that Gaius was so open to give. He has a good testimony from all. And from the truth itself. What a witness. But in conclusion, we all need an example. And we all need to be an example. John explains the shortness of his letter. I had many things to write to you, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly and we shall speak face to face. When he says, I had many things to write to you, the fact that John says here, in closing these things, you know, I, I, I have more to write. I hope to see you shortly. Right? That we shall speak face to face. Says everything about this relationship. That John had a desire to help Gaius out in his ministry. John wanted to do more for Gaius than just write him a letter. Listen, I am so grateful for the, for the men in, in my life and for the pastors that, that have been an example to me. And they're still an example to me. And they're still a part of this church. And I talk to them all the time. And occasionally they'll come down and they'll visit. And you know, because they played such a huge role in my life, they're partakers of this ministry. They're partakers even of your faithfulness. Because they were such a big part and instrumental in my life as I'm feeding you and being an example to you. What a heritage! It's important. And then we have a final blessing. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. This is a letter that describes again two men, Gaius and Diotrephes, who had two completely different characters. One was a servant 
who wanted to be a blessing to others and minister to the whole body of Christ. And Gaius, he will have peace with God because of his relationship with God, because he's walking in truth. Diotrephes, on the other hand, wanted something and wanted to be something he wasn't. With a desire to have preeminence, to be top dog, he wasn't serving anyone. And he wasn't bringing glory to God. It was pride that was robbing Diotrephes of his peace. I'm sure he lacked serious direction as a leader. But I still believe that John wanted peace for Diotrephes as well. That's why he's calling him out and reminding him of the example that Gaius is. But when he says this, our friends greet you, right? Greet the friends by name. There was a beautiful fellowship shared between John and Gaius, but it was also shared within the circle of their influence. You see, the, the church over here where Gaius is at and, and, and all the believers over here where John are at shared, right? That same fellowship, that same union, the unity was shared. Today we see this church and that church and his church and his church and very few of them share any practical unity. That's not the case. This is what God intended. And he never intended for there to be friction between two leaders or two brothers and sisters in Christ. The reality is, one's walking in truth and one isn't. One has a servant's heart. The other doesn't. One has the best interest of others and is a minister and the other just desires to have preeminence. We need to walk in truth it reflects everything. And, and again, this truth is, is the most loving form of Christianity that we can do. To, to be an example is, is so influential. To stand up. And I'm telling you today, in the midst of this, no one's asking you to, to be reckless and, and throw your masks out the window. It's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that you and I, we need to stand for truth because it is under attack. It is being chipped away. It is decaying. It is being removed. And it is the church, it is the body of Christ that stands for truth. We are the example. We are the light in the world. You're not looking to your king because it's our responsibility to walk before God in truth and not in wickedness. To be completely dependent upon God, not our king. Okay? This is important. And listen, you're going to be in a, in a world of hurt if you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. It's essential that you and I are telling people about that truth. We have to share the gospel. It's what we're called to do. It's the Great Commission. We have to live for Christ. Only what's done in this life will last. Right? Only what's done for Christ in this life will last. That's it. Nothing else matters. Revival starts with you and I. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. Lord, if there's anyone listening that has never asked you to be, your, their, to be their Lord and Savior, to, to come into their life and to forgive them of their sin, Lord, to, to receive them, God, I, I pray that they would do so now. That they would turn to you. 
cry out to you. They would receive the truth that you would open the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf. God, and give them the power to repent, to turn from their sin, and to follow after you. For the church, God, I, we pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. We pray, God, for the body to stand on its feet, to be bright, to be light, to be a witness for all to see. Truth flows from the giver of all truth. Truth does not flow from a dark house. We pray, Lord, for you to forgive us of our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. that you would do a work through your church. We pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You are mighty to save. You're a glorious God. A God of grace and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praises. As your people declare your mighty word, bless us. Thank you for joining us, whether you're here 
or you're watching on YouTube, I want to thank you for joining us. And, and listen, if you need prayer for anything this morning, don't leave the building if you need prayer. Please come forward. We want to pray for you. And if you have a prayer request, you can, again, can email us at calvarymaricopa at gmail.com. We'll get a hold of you if you give us contact. We want to pray with you and pray for your needs. If there's anything we can do to help you, please contact us. You can go to our website at calvarymaricopa.org for more teachings, and you can give online there. So with that said, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you all week. Let's go with God, church. God bless you guys. See you next week.